Hi, Rich Lindhorst. This is November 3rd, 2001 in Cincinnati, Ohio. And with me is my father, Russell J. Lindhorst. And the purpose of this interview today is to talk about his work experiences between the years of 1943 to 1945. World War II. Uh, Dad, welcome. And uh, today we're going to talk about all your different stories and everything like that. We're going to put in the tape so everybody can see you in the future. Great. You were in the Army Air Force. Correct. And uh, let's talk about when you were drafted into the Army Air Force in 1943 and uh, go from there. Well, when I was drafted, I had to report to the uh, library and I was about half a mile from it and I left that morning I walked to the library and walked into the basement and here's some older woman down there pounding on the piano and she hit some donuts and this is about 6 30 in the morning and I wasn't used to being up that early but we stood around and uh, finally the bus came we jumped on the bus and uh, I was ready to step on the bus and here a girl that I was dating, her father was there, shook my hands and said, good luck, Russ. And I think he was making sure I got on the bus. <laughs> but from there, we went to Fort Thomas and we went through all the shots and got our uniforms. And uh, I came home that night in my uniform, showed my mother and dad and I went back that night too. But uh, from there on in it was uh, business. And uh, when I was at Fort Thomas we had a fallout one morning and everybody was lined up and I guess there was a neighborhood of maybe 50 to 100 of us and they decided that uh, we didn't know what was, going, what was going to happen but they said all the fellows on the right are going to the Air Force and the ones on the left will go to the infantry. Fortunately I was on the right side. So from Fort Thomas we got on a uh, train uh, which had gas lights in it. Real modern <laughs> convenience. Old troop train. Huh? Old troop train, yes. And from there we went down to Miami Beach, Florida. Tough duty in the winter time and we took basic training there. What they tried to do is get us in condition. They exercised us, they walked us, they ran us. Uh, we were kept busy all the time. And then one day the orders came up that I was going to ship out from Miami Beach and I went up to the sergeant that morning and I said I've got an abscess tooth. Uh, I'm supposed to transfer to go to Denver, Colorado uh, should I go to the dentist the next morning or should I uh, get on the train and go to Denver? And he says, you want to get out of this hole, don't you? Miami Beach, that's a real <laughs> hole. So after I was on the train, we proceeded to Denver, Colorado. And when I got there, the first thing they sent me, they sent me to the dentist. And they really know how to fill them. They pull them out of your mouth. <laughs> so I lost my tooth. Um, when you were down in Miami Beach, didn't the commander come up and, and ask you about, or tell you about how you were part of the elite Air Force? Oh yes, when we, let, when we got there, we went into a big gymnasium. We were sitting on wooded seats. And uh, this officer came out and said, you people are on the Army Air Force. Uh, we're really pleased to have you here. You're going to be in the Elite Corps, very intelligent people. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to ask you, all those who can't read or write, please, please, please raise their right hand. It's amazing <laughs> how many right hands went up. <laughs> but uh, that's the Army. Jeez. Uh, what we're going to do, Dad, before you, uh, when you left basic training, uh, before we move on, I want to introduce uh, Al Gavin and Ralph Friedman. They're in the background. We're going to be asking you different questions. So Good. now we're going to get into the, uh, the phase after your basic training, and then you went to Denver, Colorado for gunnery training. <coughs> How were you picked to go into gunnery training? Well, they, they selected 
a group of us, not everybody went into gunnery training. They only had so many places, uh, some, so, the classes were only so, so large. So they taught you how to assemble the, the gun and how to clean the gun. Uh, probably didn't answer your question, but all of a sudden I was in gunnery training. You had the option to go into something else, didn't you? Well, if you were qualified for bomb site, you might be ended up as a cook too, or you could go into a crew chief or anything to do with airplanes. Um, how did you how did you learn how to shoot a gun? Well, they, they gave us a very basic training. We started with a BB gun, hand mounted, looked like shooting a shooting gallery in like Coney Island, where the ducks would go by. So you get the feel of a gun. And then from there, they stepped us up to a uh, rifle. <clears throat> uh, and eventually, we got up to uh, a shotgun shooting trap and skeet. That was fun, and uh, eventually they got us up to a handheld 30 caliber. And then they got us up to a 50 caliber, which was on the ground, and we shot at targets. Did you get any good at shooting skeet? We had our moments. <laughs> Depending on a windy day, maybe. On a windy day, the wind was behind me, and they take the high house, and they would release the uh, uh, disc. And we'd fire at that thing, and with the wind be, when it goes up up in the air, it would just hang right there, and you could just blast that thing to back. But it was it was, you had to be careful because your hand holding the shotgun, and the shotgun can hit your, tear your shoulders out if you mm -hmm. don't hold it tight, or it hit you on the side of the face. Mm -hmm. You learn really quickly. So if you were to go to Coney Island today and shoot a BB gun, do you feel confident that you could do better than your 11 year old grandson? Lee? They'd probably throw me out of there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, from Denver, Colorado, um, you went to Tucson, Arizona to train, and this is where your crew got formed, correct? Yeah, we Tucson, Arizona. We went down there on a train, and uh, they assigned us to a crew got together, 10 men, four officers, officers and six enlisted men. We never met each other at all before. But now we are we are all in the same. How, how did you know? I mean, how did you know where to go? Well, they, they direct you around. And they, they tell you where to report to. And then, and as far as your group is concerned, you, what, you just look on a board or they give you a piece of paper? Or? You, you would lock, go in the, uh, in the barracks and you look at the bulletin board and they would tell you where you're supposed to go. So you ended up to be in the 449th Bomb Group, which had B-24 Liberator bombers built by Consolidated. You ended up in, in the 719th Squadron, and your squad had 15 planes um, per squad. So that's 60 planes in your 719 Bomb Group, mm -hmm. correct? So when you met your crew, and you were, you were called the Flying Horseman, the 449th you don't know where that came from, right? No, somebody picked that out of the air. All right. So when you met your crew, what, what were your first impressions and what were they like? Do you remember well, those guys? Well, we all shook hands and said, where are you from? And one fellow was from California, another fellow was from Pittsburgh, and one fellow was from San Diego. And uh, after a while sitting around and shooting a breeze, we all got to know each other real well. And uh, we're all in the same situation, so we wanted to get on with it. Anybody in particular remember what was uh, what was the pilot like? What was his name? Uh, Elmer Meade. He was a lieutenant at that time, and uh, really a, a nice guy, sweetheart fellow. Very easy to talk to, very understanding. Uh, he would do almost anything for us answer any questions. He'd go to bat for us all the time. He's our leader. He's the main man. What about, uh, did you call him lieutenant or? Called him Elmer. Elmer? That's all he wanted to know, be known as. Why is that? He was that type of a guy. Mm -hmm. How about the co-pilot? He was different. <laughs> In which way? Well, 
he and Elmer never got along together. His name was uh, Keeler. We called him Keeler all the time. But when they were in the air, they were a good team. But on the ground, they never. They always agreed to disagree. <laughs> Anything in particular, or just everything in general? Well, it was one of these things. As he said, if it's black, the other guy would say it's not all black. <laughs> <laughs> what about the? Uh, what about some of the other individuals? Uh, was there? What about the? Some of the other gunners. One fellow's name was Fidel P. Guerrero. We called him Johnny, for short. <laughs> And he was a short guy, very muscular fellow. He was our ball, ball gunner and uh, really a sweetheart of a fellow. The interesting thing about him, I'm about 6'1 or 2 and he was around less than 6 foot. And when we got overseas, we pooled our clothes together, which didn't work out too long. I knew when I had his pants on. <laughs> he knew when he had my pants on. You kept in touch with him. He ended up to be living out in California. Yeah, he it was a sheriff out there. I asked him what he does all the time, and he says he takes care of all the widows. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, some of the other guys? Uh, the navigator, or some of the other gunners. Navigator was from Boston, with his accent came with him. The cotton of Coca Cola. Uh, the uh, top gunner. He was older than we were, and we were a bunch of kids to him. Uh, Petrano, it was his name. And the Sam Grassi was the other waist gunner. Cliff Kirschler was the tail gunner. And uh, we had a radio man also. And the bombardier was, we called him Skin. He was a lieutenant. And the navigator, well, that was a from Boston, and the pilot and the co-pilot, just ten of us, okay. all going, hoping, going in the same direction. Well, there you are in Tucson, and then from there, you uh, your crew is formed, and then you move. Uh, well, before you leave there, you all decide that you're going to name your plane. What did you name it? Star Eyes. There was a song by that name. Probably Hark Boogie Carmichael. All right. So Star Eyes with a crew of 10 is ready to go, and then from there you move to uh, Bruning, Nebraska. Well, we, <clears throat> we went to Bruning, Nebraska, and uh, we flew the plane to Bruning, and we all trained there uh, day in, day out, we took care of it. Uh, we're all just chill, kind of green yet, trying to get along together. What was the, uh, I'm sure there was somebody who was the commander of this group. What was he like? Who was it and what was he like? Colonel Alcar. <clears throat> he was a pilot during World War I and got shot down by the Germans. Now he's back up again with his bomb group. He's going to see how many Germans he can kill now. <laughs> and he was a tough duty guy. I mean, no nonsense. And that was his job, to get the bomb group ready to go. Did you tell me he wore a couple of watches? He always had two watches, so he was in synchronized because he was afraid one of them wouldn't be right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, from Bruning, Nebraska, which is a relatively short period, well, about a month you were there. And then you go off to uh, Topeka, Kansas, and this is the beginning of the, the trip to the European theater. We were, that was a fun time. They would, we were up there for about a week or so, and we could go off base. Uh, they never cared to where you reported to if you came back two o'clock in the morning or six o'clock or didn't come back at all but then they put us on a uh, call that be ready to go and they issued us 45 pistols with ammunition mm -hmm. uh, there were some stories told and not how true they are but when they issued the ammunition there were some fellows knew that soon they would be leaving the states and some of them shot themselves in the leg or whatever so they didn't have to go to, go to combat. Mm -hmm. Of course, <laughs> nobody fooled with the guns after that. <laughs> <laughs> and you kept that at 45 probably throughout the war, correct? Right. All right. There's a funny story I'll tell you later about that later, that 45. 
Tell me now. Well, when we flew, uh, we carried that 45 with us, and they gave us a shoulder holster for that. Well, when you had your all your gear on, and you're gonna put your parachute, that shoulder holster gets kind of tough on the ribs. So what the fellows would do is they would put the 45 on their back behind them. And we always thought if we ever got shot down, in <laughs> a bailout and got shot down, and somebody would come and try to get us, how are we going to get a hold of the gun? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That'd be last. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't get shot down. <laughs> So after the wild time in Topeka, Kansas, which I guess a wild time in Topeka, Kansas is probably an oxymoron. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, then after that, you're armed, you're ready to go, and you're off to Key West, Florida. So you're back closer to the hellhole of Miami. Right. So it was nice and sunshiny down there. We just stayed there overnight, gassed up, took off, and we took the southern route down into uh, South America and we landed in Belém and uh, we stayed there for about a week. Uh, the bomb bays were empty and they had racks there that they could uh, carry our clothing or whatever we wanted to take with us. And then they told us the next day we were going to be leaving not as a bomb group but individual planes because we are on our way to Africa. And uh, we got out, I don't know, we got about an hour or so, and the bombardier was screwing around in the nose turret, and he was operating the guns and the plexiglass there, and what he did was he got a, a flasher a light hooked up, uh, swedge between the plastic, uh, plas uh, plastic, and he cracked the nose turret. Uh, so we had to turn around and go back because it was slowing us down. So we get back into uh, South America and we had that bomb bay loaded with bananas and everything we could think of. So we didn't know how long we were going to be there so we had to throw all the bananas out again. And finally the crew chief uh, drilled the nose turret plexiglass and he took lashing wire and he pulled the thing together so we, we could proceed on. And then we flew over to Dakar <coughs> and landed in, in Africa. What did that place look like? Did, uh, one, one question, Russ, did others have difficulty getting across also? We did? never knew. Uh, you didn't know? We knew, never knew until we got there, until they all landed and got together. So. Do you know if there were rescue vessels stationed across the ocean in case? Not to my knowledge, yeah. Uh, the sad part about on the way to Africa, we lost three airplanes. Uh, lost them, ditched them, ran out of gas yeah. or for some untold reason. Never heard what happened one, to One them. guy hit a mountain. Uh, that was that happened to be, we found out later on, that was fairly common. They were losing airplanes as on, in route. Because they got lost, they ran out of gas, or any, any idea why? In experience. In experience, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. We're all young people, you know. Yes. Hmm. Well, then we, we were in Dakar there for maybe, oh, week plus sometime, and then we proceeded up to northern Africa, to Marrakesh, and, stay, and stayed there, and I'm laughing about that, because every time we land in one of these airports, uh, and, and bear in mind, when you're in that part of the country, you call them airports, but they're not really airports. And we would touch down, and then they'd come out to gas the airplane, and some of these gooks there who brought out the trucks with the fuel, they would uh, throw the nozzle up on the wing and then would fall off and go into the sand. And that's when Elmer Mead got rather disturbed. <laughs> he said, get those guys out of here. 
because he doesn't want any sand in his gasoline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what we did, and then we gassed the airplanes. They got up in the wings and we, we cleaned the thing up. But uh, we stayed there for a while. Where would you sleep? In the airplane. Was that comfortable? Never, never. By the same token, we had to guard the airplane because you couldn't trust anybody around you. Now, we didn't see any other planes there because we were in Marrakesh. Other, other planes, you mean? From the bomb, bomb group, or from the squadron. We okay. weren't flying in formation or anything over there. We were all on our own. no other planes there? We didn't see any of it belong to us. To your group? Yeah. They may have been behind us. We could have been ahead of somebody or we oh, okay. could have been behind somebody. All right, but there were other American bombers at that yeah. airfield. Yeah. Which is nothing more than really a dirt strip, right? That's right. Okay. So we laid around there for a while until we could go up into Grutaglia, Italy, which is at the end step of the boot. And uh, we flew into there, and that was a dirt runway. And there was no hangars, there was no tents, there was no ha no place to sleep. So we slept in the airplane there for about two, three weeks. And uh, very enjoyable. Uh, nothing to do during the day uh, other, other than argue with each other. What, uh, what kind of food would you eat and how would you clean yourself? And would, did you, somebody have to guard the plane or? You know, guarding the plane was a problem. Uh, after a while, we got kind of lax at guarding the airplane. Because one night, we were up in a tent in Marrakesh, and the, uh, Elmer came in, and he says, who's got the airplane tonight? We all looked at each other. He says, you telling me that there's nobody out there guarding an airplane? Uh, yes, sir, there's nobody out there guarding the airplane. All of a sudden, two fellows disappeared real quick, like, <laughs> and went into the airplane. And all they would do is sit up in a cockpit and look around and make sure nobody bothered it. What did you have to eat? We had some K rations. What was that like? Bad news. What is it? A little bit of everything. <laughs> uh, there was some chocolate in there. We knew that because. Uh, we loved the chocolate, but uh, they had some they had some crackers in there. We had enough food, and we would they would bring some food into us every now and then. Oh, we prepared hot food. Yes, mm -hmm. but we still slept in the airplane. And to to shower and do your laundry. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so you were in Italy with what? Well, did you see any of the Italians? Because the Italians had, had been on the side of the Germans. Yeah, southern Italy was basically surrendered. Uh, and uh, when we were in Cataglia, the closest town to us was about uh, 15 miles. And we would go in there, we'd hop a thumb a ride in on one of the army trucks and we go into southern Italy and the officers from generals or we thought they were generals or something in the town of Toronto they walked around like they were King B because they didn't have anything to do and all they did was beg from us for food or money. These were the generals or the soldiers? Yeah. The Italian soldiers? Yeah. But they were, uh, we didn't pay any attention to them. And they had a USO in there too, which could help us, give us food. Mm -hmm. So we could go into town there, we'd take a hot shower there. Mm -hmm. We enjoyed that. And by the time we got back to the base, after riding in the back of the truck, we were all dirty again. <laughs> Was your base ever bombed by the Germans? Oh yes. Uh, we used to call this guy uh, Fido. You hear him come over at night. And he was, wasn't really, he didn't bomb, he was just taking pictures, uh, surveying where, where, where are, how many airplanes we had, and whatnot. And the British had any aircraft guns all around us to protect the base. But the, uh, 
we had slit trenches out there so that uh, we could go into them if we had to. Mm -hmm. Well, one night when the any aircraft guns go off, uh, you wouldn't pay too much attention to him. He said, well, he's just flying by. But there was one about, he was only about the aircraft gun, any aircraft gun, probably about uh, 100 yards from us. When he went off, you know he meant business, and we'd all go out in the slit trench and sit there with our helmets over our head. And my <laughs> Guerrero said to me, Russ will be our luck, we'll get killed in the sled trench instead of in the air. <laughs> so after he went by, then we go back to the tent. Finally, your crew came over from, from what, the United States, and they set up the... The ground crew came in, and they set up the tents, and they set up food for us, mess hall, so that we could eat. And uh, they brought supplies with us. And... Uh, we put up the tent and we needed heat in there so we <clears throat> slightly borrowed which meant we stole a tank so we could put gasoline in it and we ran a aluminum line into the tent and we had a pinch hose to keep the flow and we put had a hundred octane in the tank in the tank and this then would flow into a, a, a barrel we put rocks in there, and then it would just drip in. And of course, somebody had to light that dude. And someone would throw a match in there, and the thing would go, Whoa! and get your eyebrows burned off or whatever. But Did we lose uh, any tents? Oh, yes. A lot of tents went up in flames. <laughs> 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 and they blew up fast, too, you know. <laughs> well, we're, the, the, the tent stories are funny because of the 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 four enlisted men in there. I mean, the, the six enlisted men in there, you know. And uh, when we, we had a rainy season there where we couldn't fly because it was too muddy, couldn't get, get off the air, uh, air strip. But we, somebody would come by, some guy from another tent come in, how are you fellas doing today? You know, what's, what's happening? You got any magazines or anything? No, nothing. What we say is, wait, they would steal our water outside. So anytime some guy came in the tent, two of us went back outside because we had a, cans of water out there. <laughs> but we live and learn. You told me one time you, it was a big treat to go get a Coca-Cola? Yeah, big deal that day. Everybody can have a Coca-Cola. One co Coca-Cola and one candy bar. So we must have lined up, it seemed like it was for miles. <laughs> to get that Coca-Cola. And finally when we got the Coke, never tasted so bad in his life because we'd never had anything like that to drink. It was good Coca-Cola, I guess, when it left the States, but it wasn't too good when it got to us. <laughs> guess yeah. you just weren't used to it, huh? I wasn't used to it at all. Yeah. Um, so finally, um, you start going on your missions to Balm, your different sites throughout Italy and wherever. You want to talk about some of those? Well, the first mission we had was, what we call, it's a term called milk run, which was rather simple. They must have picked this target out because we didn't get too much flack. And it was right across the Adriatic. And it was a short run. Uh, we never saw any enemy because the fighters shielded us all the time, took care of them the first day. So we thought, boy, this is going to be fun now. So, when we would go to briefing in the morning, they wake us up around six o'clock or so, and we would start to dress, and we had uh, put on our long underwear, and then we had a heated suit, and then we put our flight, our uh, regular uh, flight gear over that, and then we would go down to the briefing, in the briefing, we would uh, look at a map to see where we're going to bomb that given day. And they would tell us what time we're going to start the engines and what time we we're going to hit the target, uh, where we would pick up the escort, and how much, how much, how many bombs we had on board. And uh, then they, those care 
for those who wanted to go to a priest to hear, they would pray for us all. And then they would, uh, <laughs> the people who were permanent party there who didn't fly would give us all these instructions. And then they say, uh, we are going to take off at 0800. Uh, we will uh, have the formation intact in the next hour or so, circling around till we got them all ready to go. And when you come back, we will be here waiting for you. <laughs> who's we, right? <laughs> yeah, who's that we, we all the way home. Um, but uh, once you got out of the briefing, then you go out to the airplane, and then you uh, kill some time and uh, wait till they fire the flares, and you knew it was time for us to leave there, start the engines and go. Uh, Cliff Kirschler, the tail gunner, we could never get him out of bed in the morning. So he never made the briefings. And then he'd come walking down through the, from the olive grove down into the plane. He says, does anybody know where we're going today? <laughs> we say, yes, we're going to so-and-so place. Where's that? We haven't got the slightest idea. Was there much of an appetite for breakfast knowing that you're going on a flight? Could, could oh, you conditioned yourself for that after a while. Uh, okay. uh -huh. It was... so. Uh, hit and miss. Sometimes you were hungry, sometimes you weren't. Some guys would eat a big full breakfast. You ever take food along on the plane with you? No way. No way. Uh, remember I talked about K rations? Uh, the only thing we had aboard was some K rations on the plane. And we would prac open one of those up and I mentioned chocolate. And when you're flying at 27,000 feet, <laughs> that chocolate gets rather, rather hard, rather fast. <laughs> and we want to eat something when we, well, after we could take our mask off, you know. Yeah. And there was no way we could break that up. We throw it against the side of the airplane. We bounce it off the wall. <laughs> we scratch it. We try anything just to get a piece of chocolate off of that thing. Mm -hmm. And it never happens. <laughs> uh, the moral, but, moral of the story is don't try to eat chocolate at 27,000 feet. Oh, no. That's it. But once we got a bear born, and then the formation was formed, and uh, we went, rode around for a while in circles. Nobody's got anything to do at the time. Uh, some of the guys back in the waste section would fall, maybe fall back asleep again. Or now, bear in mind, in the waste section, there's no windows there. Uh, it's cold. The only the pilot was protected with windows and the gunners were protected, but in the waste section, the windows were, I guess, 36 by 36 inches. No way, to, there's nothing to close. They took the windows out. Yeah. So it's just a boring time for you. Boring time, yeah. Because when we would take off, we'd all be sitting down on the floor. Yeah. And when we hit wet runways, huh, the wheels would spin up water into the airplane. Mm -hmm. And you select somebody throwing a bucket of water at you. Oh, so, you know, we learned where to get position ourselves <laughs> on days like that. Uh -huh. Let's talk about uh, going on some of the bombing runs. What's it like <clears throat> when you're going into a uh, area that you're going to bomb? Well, on the way to the target, you had a chance to test fire your gun so they would fire. And uh, that was a procedure like the tail gunner would say he's going to fire his guns over the intercom and so forth. And, or, and he would report back his guns were okay and so forth and so on. So that they, they knew we were ready with the guns. Uh, you had no idea where you were because uh, we're sitting got our oxygen mask on. We all sound like Donald Duck talking on there. Uh, the ball gunner's down in his position. Everybody was ready to go. So we just ride on and ride on and then finally someone say the navigator is would say uh, we should be there in half an hour or so. Uh, you were alert all the time looking for anything flying at you. Uh, 
he stayed away from the big cities going over because they had any aircraft and you would still try to have the formation together. Then they would say, okay, we're going to go in. Uh, you never saw the target. We never saw the target itself. We could see the other airplanes around us, our, our airplanes. Uh, sometimes we bombed by radar because it was overcast. Uh, I truthfully believe our percentage of bomb hitting the targets was rather low, maybe what? about 3%. What, what kind of targets did you go after? For well, the strategy there was to keep the Germans from bringing supplies down. We hit airfields, we hit railroad stations, we hit ports, uh, we hit uh, any boats, harbors, anything to keep them from bringing supplies down to the southern mm -hmm. Italy. And that was the strategy. Uh, later on in the war, uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, there wasn't anything to hardly to bomb anymore. And there was no resistance. Now, when I left, I, when I left Italy, I think the guys who followed us from bomb runs, they were looking for targets. Uh, but the things that I remember, and some of some of the tough targets. I mean, you don't know what you're going to get at any time. You know that you're going to get flak. Uh, all depends what altitude you're flying at. I remember Palusti raids were tough raids, really tough raids. What I remember about that raid more than anything else was we had fighters coming at us on the way in, we had fighters coming at us on the way out, and we had flak, flak, flak galore. One guy, one time on the intercom says, you might as well put the gear down, we'll taxi across on the flak. Because it's <laughs> bursting up at you real fast. Is it scary? Well, the scariest part, and I remember this one real well, the target, say, is over here on the right. And you're coming in this way, and you're going to circle around and go into that, to plus the oil fields. Well, here you are over here, and you're seeing the first group wave go in over here. And as you can see them getting flat galore, you're seeing some of their airplanes go down, being shot down, burst down. You say, you're next. <laughs> you get to go now. And then you say, oh boy. <laughs> a lot of guys didn't make it from Pulaski. A lot of that, they lost a lot of airplanes at Pulaski. Did you get a lot of did you get a lot of uh, damage on your planes? Uh, one thing that I remember real well in the waste section, right above my head, they blew a hole about that big from the flak. Now the flak, I don't know if anybody knows what it means, but when it goes up in the air, it's just time to explode, and it has shrapnel in it. You just they, if if the flak was above us when it burst, it'd come down and it hit on top of the airplane like th people throwing gravel at you. Uh, you could see it. The best example I can think of flak is, you ever go to Coney Island when they have fireworks? And when they have those fireworks, it is really noisy. And the last blast the last blast you always hear is when they have that big barrage, boom, 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 boom. That's what it sounds like with flak. That much, that rapid, concentrated all the time. See, they, they don't care who they hit as long as they hit something. Yeah, as long as they hit something. Uh -huh. And they also are uh, not trying to hit you as an individual. They just throw up a barrage. Yeah. So uh, that's the biggest fear, I think, in a bomb run, the flak. What brought down more planes, the flak or the fighters? I would say the flak. Really? Yeah. Wow.
unfortunately, the fighters would, uh, when we first, the first flights to Palesti are long range bombing runs, bombs. Uh, we had escorts with P 38s who could chase the, the fighters away from us, protect us. But they didn't have the range, so when they left, we were escorted by German ME-109s and FW-190s, mm -hmm. and they weren't on our side. Then came the P-51s, and the P-51s had the range and go all the way with us. You eventually got P-51 escorts. P-51s escorts, yes. Uh -huh. And the P-38s were still around, but they didn't have the range. Yeah. Uh, we bombed Palesti, we bombed, bombed up into uh, Italy. We did not bomb Rome or Florence or there's mm -hmm. places like that. Uh, the targets were basically airfields, uh, marshalling yards, anything that they could haul stuff down. And did you go into Albania, Romania, uh, the other, the Baltic countries as well? Uh, when one of the missions, my last mission, was up into uh, near Venice, uh, and we thought it was going to be a milk run. Milk run means an easy game. Yeah. They almost blew us out of the air. So you never know. You never know. Yeah. Uh, I went to Regensburg, which was a tough target. Mm -hmm. uh, had one swipe car. I forget the name of it, German name. Uh, that was a tough target. Uh, on the way out, back out of there, uh, we lost an engine. We lost an engine, we lost altitude. We lost the formation. Mm -hmm. When you leave the formation, you're a sitting duck for anything to come to you. Finally, we made it back over the Adriatic. pilot brought the airplane real close to the water because if any fighters would come to us they couldn't die because they couldn't pull out they'd hit the water. So he says let's start throwing things over over the side. So we threw anything we could think of would be heavy enough to throw it out the window which we did. And uh, we came over the field and the pilot said uh, okay fellas I'm going to keep it up high as I can and you fellas are going to bail out I'll bring it in. So we pulled up the trap door in the back of the airplane and looked down through the hole and we said, we're going with you. <laughs> we're not bailing out. <laughs> and you never did bail out. Never bailed, bailed out. Once. The uh -huh. uh, problem with parachute, well, bear in mind, when we go over the target, we had a flak suit, which would protect you. And those things were heavy. Yeah. And. Uh, we would put our helmet on that too, a uh, steel helmet. And we try to make itself as small as we possibly can because when you're going over the target, you're not going to be shooting at anything because they're shooting at you. And when you come off the target, then you put the helmet down, then you get back to your gun again. The uh, interesting thing is that uh, the parachute, they gave us uh, chest parachutes you'd have to clip it on and then you could pull the cord and go. Well the problem with that is if you ever got hit, the airplane's spinning or something, you're no way going to be able to pick up a parachute. So I got a backpack which was on my back mm -hmm. parachute. So it was with me all the time. So on my last mission on the ground I pulled the parachute. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't uh, have to use it, but it worked. <laughs> how, how did you know it was your last mission? Well, I hit 50, and then they gave us two more. We were over. I hit 50 missions, and then I, they gave us two more to go. Because yeah. sometimes they would run out of airplanes, they would run out of crews, and they say, you're going to go again. So we, you keep saying, 
how many more times are we going to go? And he says, you only got two more to go. So after we had the, the 52nd one done, when we were on the ground, we pulled the river guard. How, I, I, one hears of 25 or 30 missions and you go home. How come you were lucky enough to get 50? Out of England, I think 25 was their max there. But uh, obviously that wasn't... Uh, not, a, not where we came from. Not, not for you. <laughs> lucky you. There was a story you told me about uh, in a particularly rough mission where Guerrero was involved? Yeah, Guerrero was down in the Balter. And uh, he was down there. I don't know if you know how a ball gunner does it. He sits, he, you put him in the airplane, you sit him there. And then he closes the door and then he's ready to, to flop around. He can go 360, point his guns up, whatnot. And he controls them from above his head. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he fires, it, it vibrates. Uh, he didn't close the door all the way on his back there, and the, the flat part of the door opened up. Now here he is, that's breezing down on him. And he calls and he says he was in trouble. So he finally got his turret so that we could go down and pull him out. Now, that was very difficult because you got your oxygen mask on and it's hard to pull a guy up. So I went down there and I pulled him out. And uh, we didn't think anything of the time. He got him back up there, got him warm again, just tried to get him circulating, whatnot. He well, could have froze to death down there. So, uh, after we came, after I was discharged and back in the States, and he wrote me a letter. And he said he wanted to thank me for taking him out. I never thought that happened. Were any of your crew injured? Were we there? lost a co pilot. Uh, he was flying on a different substituting for another plane. Uh, is flying as a co-pilot on a different plane on one given mission and had that, that, that plane went down. Mm -hmm. The most uh, dramatic thing I remember real well is we're on a bomb run and the flak came up and there was a co-pilot, not him, but there was a Captain Swan was flying co-pilot that day and the flak came up and hit the hydraulic lines on the airplane and they're along the skin of the airplane there. And that's red, hydraulic fluid. And the flak came up, hit him in the leg, hit him in the shoulder, and hit him in the one arm, and one shoulder, in his, in his right leg. The flak came through there. And he hollers over the intercom, I'm bleeding to death. Well, he was, he was bleeding, yes, but it, he saw all this hydraulic fluid all red all over it, and he thought he was bleeding to death. So the, um, the ball, tail, top gunner pulled him out and gave him morphine, and then somebody had sat in for the, for the uh, co-pilot seat. Uh, at that altitude, with that temperature, your blood congeals. And uh, so when we, we came back and uh, we shot a flare when we landed over Utaglia, and then the meat wagon came out, took him back. He recovered. Uh, none of the other fellows ever got hit with anything. That's I never got hit with anything. That's either. amazing. But unfortunately, from your squadron, there were tremendous losses, though. We went over with 15 airplanes in that given squadron. We came back with three. How many planes did you go through? We went through three airplanes. And I say going through them means this. They were damaged enough 
that they put them in the set for salvage. And when a plane was pushed aside, like a bunch of vultures are out there, they're picking pieces off of mm -hmm. uh, parts yeah. galore. How long did some of those planes last? How long did the first one last? That was the one that was painted green, right? They're all green. Except later in the war, they, they didn't paint them anymore. How long did the first one last? I think we had about six or seven missions on it. And was that shot up from flak? The interesting thing about flak when you land, the ground crew comes out to meet you all the time. And you're taxiing in and out. And you know, this is this is a fun time now. You're taxiing in, your wheels are on the ground, how sweet it can be, you know? <laughs> and the guys running around, the sheet metal guys running around, he's hollering. And he holds, and he holds, because he's got a patch of holes so the plane can go the next day. Mm -hmm. And it has to be gassed up and ready to go. And they did a good job. It was always funny to us because it wasn't well, it wasn't funny to us, but it was funny to him, I guess. Wasn't there a plane that was so shot up that they called it patches? I think I read that someplace. It had all these patches all over it. What when you told me that during that one rough mission that you came back where you had to throw everything overboard? That uh, and mercifully, where you didn't have to jump out, didn't the pilot receive a medal for that? Captain, yeah, silver medal, silver star. And when you got off the plane, you could you could have a drink, right? Yeah, when, when the mission was over, you go back and you would uh, uh, they debrief you. Did you see anybody? If some plane went down, you want to see how many chutes came out. And count. Then you knew they got out. A lot of times a plane would explode, too. Just completely out of the All they see would be a puff and there'd be nothing left. But uh, you're always alert of a plane going down around you. You don't know who they are. You couldn't identify them at all. Uh, we had one guy, one plane went down. Uh, this fella, his name was uh, Kitchens. His last name was Kitchen. He was a gunner. And uh, he went down. We called him Mess Halls. We never called him the Kitchens. And after the, uh, about six weeks later, he walked back from northern Italy. And I say walked back, he bailed out and he told us of what happened. Uh, the Italians picked him up and hit him. And I say walked back because then they would take him at night time moving closer to the, the line so that he would be on the safe part of it. He could tell us what he who, how he lived and the people protected him but he couldn't tell us how he got across the front of the line to be taken back in the safe area. And he just walked back. It's the only way to get back. Wow. I was getting back to the shot. Didn't they give you some whiskey? You didn't have a chance of that? or? Yeah, you can have whiskey if you want, or you get a donut, uh, or you want to go back to eat. Uh, we had a Maybe about an hour or two later, anybody wanted to go to mass, you could go to a, a, a hall and you sit there and go to mass. And as the war went on, uh, we maybe had 15 guys there. Sometimes we would have 10. One time I was the only guy sitting there. And the priest said to me, where is everybody? I said, I don't know. He said, can you serve? And I says, no, I was a singer as a boy. He says, you're a server today. <laughs> 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 yeah. But uh, when the mission was over, and uh, I'll back up here, when we went on a mission, we bought a visual light. And in our tent, we had it uh, on the top of an empty ammunition box. 
and the guys would say, Russ, did you light the candle before we went on the mission? I said, yes. So we would uh, light the candle and then we would come back and I would go in there and uh, extinguish the candle. And it was floating in oil. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we came back, uh, if the fire was out in the can, we had to light that. And we had to get volunteers to go in there and light that thing again because it go, whoa, because all the fumes were there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then keep the flap open because he's coming out of here right away. <laughs> but the one day we aborted, we had to come back, we lost the supercharger. We came back and the candle was out. Now that's spooky. But those guys were on my back all the time. Did you light the candle? Did you light the candle? You're, you're a gunner, and when you're firing at oncoming enemy fighters, how do you know how not to hit a neighboring B-24? Uh, it's, it's very difficult. You have, to be, you have to keep in mind what you're trying to accomplish there. Now, you know, the wingmen on either side of you could get shot very easily, and they could shoot us also. Uh, there's a high flight, there's a low medium flight, and there's a low flight. So that protects us like steps yes. to get out of that. Uh, in the waist section, you have a loose gun. I mean, you can swing it as, as far as you can, mm -hmm. either way. Uh, I put a hole through the tail of the our air, my own airplane, and that was an accident, really. I wasn't aiming at it or anything like that. I fired my gun and I just laid it, uh, put it, just let it rest back, and the round was hot in there. One round, I didn't clear the round out, and phew, went right through the tail. Didn't hurt the airplane other than put a hole in it. Uh -huh. uh, I got hell for that, too. Oh. <laughs> Hey, by the way, did you know there's a hole in your tail? <laughs> One of the interesting thing is when we were, uh, we got off, uh, you get down to around uh, 10,000 feet, you take your oxygen mask off and you had to be very careful how you took that off because you had your oxygen mask on and when you're up at that cold altitude, the mask has a metal clip here. And when you take your mask off, you took your skin off mm -hmm. with you. Very common. Everybody's walking around with a band-aid. And how that happened was the oxygen mask, the outlets for the saliva and whatnot would freeze up. So the air, so the, you had to breathe through something and it would re go up through the side of the mask and that in turn would give moisture there mm -hmm. and that's how you got skin taken off. A lot of fella got uh, uh, frozen real bad with that. Uh, when you, one time we were coming back and we were out of combat zone completely. Everybody's relaxing. They would turn the radio on over the intercom system and be some guy, gal singing from the BBC. She had a lousy voice, but we thought she was great, you know. Uh, but we were real re relaxed, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes two German fighters right through the formation diving. This fellow was so close, I could see his scarf. And boy, did we get hell from the pilot. <laughs> he says, aren't you awake back there? What's going on? Nobody saw him. He went right through us, fired his gun, didn't hit anything. I guess he was having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, when we get ready to land, the waste section had a, uh, a gun deflector to keep the wind, mm -hmm. to keep the protective from the, the uh, gun flopping back and forth. The pilot could tell if they were open or closed by the control of the airplane. Mm -hmm. 
and he would say, did you close, if you only close one deflector, it would make a difference for him, mm -hmm. so he'd line, tune it up again. Sure. Uh, funny things happen when you come back, you relax now, and all of a sudden one guy says, I gotta pee. What do you do? Well, they had a relief tube there, like a funnel, which was always frozen. <laughs> so, sometimes I better stop my story here. <laughs> sometimes it never, no place did the tube, but it went in the airplane. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Sure. yeah. And it was spraying every place. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, talking about that, how, what was the furthest in distance and time of, of the, the flight? The longest flight and the furthest you, you flew. Do you remember? They seemed to average her in the neighborhood of 10 hours. Eight, eight, eight hours is common, very common. I logged everything like that in, a, in my... I logged every mission. I logged every mission, how long it was, where we went, and uh, how long mm -hmm. of time, mm -hmm. what we dropped. It's interesting. Uh, I brought that back in rough form and somebody recopied it for me and it's in my book. That's great. And when the uh, bomb group came out with their association, I was right on target. <laughs> Same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were ready to land, they had the gun deflectors in and then they would drop the wheels and then you had to see there's a little flap off of the off, off the gear that came down, and there was a little, it was yellow, and you could tell. And you would, the waist gunners would have to say, "Right gear down and locked, left gear down and locked." I'm sure the pilot knew it, but when that thing flopped down, that means they were locked in, mm -hmm. so it could touch down. What always amazed me: how in the world, going through all that flak that we never had a flat tire. Because if you land with a flat tire, that's bad news. Yeah. The, the mission I mentioned before, that where we had to throw everything overboard, he couldn't get the flaps down because he had no hydraulic. Mm -hmm. Had a heck of a time getting the gear down. We got the ball turret up okay, but he came in hot really hot. And the only way he could stop it, because he didn't have any brakes, was he feathered one. One of the engines was dead anyway. And he feathered the other one, and he spun it around. That was thrilling. Yeah, yeah. How fast do you think he's coming in? Probably 100 some odd miles an hour. No, they, the stalling speed, I don't know what the stalling speed with that plane was. It, you knew when the stalling speed speed was there because a horn would go and blow. And there would be a lot of mean conversation when the horn was blowing because mm -hmm. <laughs> it hit us, pick up the speed again. Yeah. Coming back on that mission where you're in so much trouble, did you have any escort? Did they send any escorts out to help you or boats or anything? No. Nothing. Did anybody know where you were? I guess they didn't have the radar. No. That's kind of you were on you were on your own. Yeah, yeah. What what uh, it's interesting the days that we did fly, which we were, you know. It's 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 more it's more frightening the day you don't fly than the day you fly. Why? Because you're sweating the other guys out. Hmm. You count the airplanes. Count every airplane that comes in. Mm -hmm. If we're coming in and over the four, they buzz. You come over the field, and then they start to go around. And they peel off. Well, one particular squadron used to give us a lot of flack, talking to us, mean and nasty. We'd buzz their tent area, and he pitch a props, and we see how many tents we could blow down. <laughs> <laughs> We knew they were going to get us one of these days too, you know. <laughs> Everybody go ahead and hold their pole, you know. <laughs> Funny. 
Um, when your your missions were over, anything else you want to talk about in the missions? You went through three airplanes. Not a lot of guys came back. Finally, it comes to an end. Well, you were your crew was very close because we saw talked to each other day in day out. A lot of other, even within our own squadron, a lot of us weren't that close together because we didn't have time to really get together. Uh, another squadron, you know, they didn't know who they were mm -hmm. at all. They didn't know who we were either. Uh, you would really sweat out when you're on the ground. Coming home, you count the airplanes coming in and uh, what condition they came in. Yeah. That was a hard part. And some, there, we had one, there was one crew, I think they were worried a little bit worried about this pilot. He boarded four times in a row. Wow. He found some excuse not to go to the target. And uh, he'd always find an excuse and you wondered if it was true or not. Mm -hmm. Um, one fellow on that crew, his name was Corso. He was from uh, Brooklyn. And he had the brogue that went with it. And you put an oxygen mask on him, who couldn't, he, you couldn't understand him at all. <laughs> and this way, he, Corso, he was from Brooklyn. The rest of the crew was all from the South. Oh, geez. And he said, I don't understand any of you people. <laughs> and they would say, we don't understand you either. That's right. uh -huh. <laughs> what a mix. You know, a mix. That's a real world. Yes. Mm -hmm. What were the Italian people like when you went into Toronto? Very, very friendly. Very friendly. Uh, we went to a little town, Grutaglia. The only thing we got there is an ice cream cone. They had a lot of, lot of uh, stuff in the windows, but they didn't have anything on the shelves. That was a row inventory in the windows. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go in there and get our picture taken. Uh, we would walk to town. By laundry, the uh, people would come around, the Italians, and they would say, uh, laundry, laundry. And if we had any laundry, we'd give it to them. And we would pay them off in cigarettes. Uh, can't remember what cigarettes they were, they wouldn't accept them. No Raleigh, they didn't want Raleigh cigarettes. Uh, we found out that the, when they would bring our laundry back, uh, we hoped we would get it back. <laughs> uh, they wouldn't want to, we found out that if the kids came back and took the cigarettes, somebody off the base would beat the kids up and take the cigarettes mm -hmm. away from them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and when they bought, brought the bombs in on the train, uh, the guys would go down there and bring, give the engineer wine, and the reason they would get him loaded was so they could steal the coal off of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> This is a happy day, you know. <laughs> Got cold, keep warm. <laughs> what was it like with the ground crew? What are the, do you remember any of those guys? Do you remember anything about that? Or is it just kind of like the functionaries around a plane? I was talking to another bomb group one day. They're about their ground crews. And he, ground crew man, said he never got too close to the crews. Yeah. Because he puts, he was a st very statistic minded. He said crews would last about 14 and a half missions. He didn't want to get that close to him mm -hmm. because then he, he lost a lot. Mm -hmm. Our ground crew chief was an excellent man, Peluso. And uh, a lot of times he would talk in Italians. We had one fellow on a crew, Sam Grassi. He was uh, Italian and we would go into town and uh, he would communicate with a clerk or anybody and they'd laugh at him and he'd say, Sicilian, Sicilian. 
the different dialect, like the southern people here and the northern people, yeah. and they laugh, and he gets so mad because he didn't know what they were talking about, you know. Until we finally one day they said, "You're not one of them. You're from your your family came from Sicily." <laughs> but at least we could communicate with them, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the dialect. Yeah. Uh, when our time came up for, uh, and then we know that we were going to go back. Uh, they flew us into Naples, which was a replacement depot. What kind of plane? How did you get there? Like a, a B-24. Okay. Uh, what we what what we would do sometimes if we didn't have a day to fly combat, we'd fly maybe take a plane back to another airfield because he was short one. But we take this guy's airplane back, and this pilot was not one of us, but a different guy. And what we would do is we'd all run to the front of the airplane, oh, we'd yeah. run to the back of the airplane. Oh, yeah. He'd trim it up again. <laughs> he gets it all trimmed up. We all go back again. <laughs> Anything to have fun, you know? <laughs> So you finally got to go, you got to Naples, and you got the opportunity to come home. Let's talk about that. Okay, then we got to Naples, and we were placed there, and we were mixed in with the infantry, uh, yeah. armor divisions, and whatnot. We slept in tents. A lot of people had malaria, and we stayed there. We didn't know when we were going to go because it was a boat that was going to take us back. And one day they said, we're up. Uh, we're going to go. And I think five of us went up the gangplank with our barrack bag and they pulled us back down. And they, we had to get off the boat. They wouldn't let us on. They wanted to take German prisoners back to the States before they put take a, took us back. So we finally got on the boat and down below uh, we were sleeping in hammocks, mm -hmm. hotter than hell down there. So a buddy of mine, uh, we teamed up together. We said, we're not going to sleep down there, we're going to sleep up on deck. Mm -hmm. So we took some blankets with us. And we came back through uh, Gibraltar. And uh, we wake up, this guy, his name was Red, we woke up and he says, I think the boat's on fire. I said, what do you mean? He said, look at all the smoke. Well, it wasn't, it was smoke all right. They were laying a screen, screen because there were submarines in the area. So the, the whole convoy was trying to get blacked out. So we learned real quick that we better sleep up on top, not down below. <laughs> the food wasn't the greatest. We weren't used to being rocked around on a boat. We found out real quick, you can't shower with salt water. It won't sub. <laughs> uh, finally got back to the States, Newport News, got off. Uh, put me on furlough, brought me back to Cincinnati. Uh, went back to from Cincinnati went back to uh, Florida where they give us R and R rest and recuperation. Uh, then they interviewed me and asked me uh, what type of assignment is available. They gave me three choices. I could go back on a B twenty four to Italy. I could go back to the Southern Pacific on a 24, where I could become a gunnery instruction, instructor. That was a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, you had to think hard about that. <laughs> well, would you believe? <laughs> I picked to be a gunnery instructor. So they sent me to instructor school, and then I went to Mountain Home, Idaho, as a gunnery instructor. And uh, it was kind of an easy job. Uh, Mountain Home, Idaho, 
what I remember about Mountain Home, Idaho, uh, my buddy and I left Cincinnati. We, we, we came, we, we got our assignment, came back to Cincinnati, had to go to Mountain Home, Idaho. I said, I'll meet you in Chicago. We'll catch a train to Mountain Home, Idaho. There was no troop train then. We went on a regular train. Uh, got on the train. They had these tickets, which are about this long. Uh, mm -hmm. So the conductor would punch them. <laughs> yeah. We get on the, the train and he says, Soldier, where are you going? In Mountain Home, Idaho. Everybody in the car laughed. We thought, what's wrong with Mountain Home, Idaho? Well, we found out real quick, like, when we got to Mountain Home, I, I, Mountain Home, Idaho, they threw our baggage off, we got off, that was it. and that was it. That was Mountain Home, Idaho. And nothing there? Nothing there at all. <laughs> Just a train stop. So we called the air base. They sent down a uh, staff car to uh, pick us up and take us back to the base. And uh, I became a gunnery, gunnery instructor there. And really, what it was, it was a pretty nice job. Uh, for this reason, that uh, the only problem we had were the officers who came through the course. Uh, they knew it all, they thought they knew it all until we took them out on the range that they didn't know anything at all. But they tried to throw their rank around. But it was a good job. Colder than hell there. Oh, it was it cold. <laughs> Man. What, what time is this? What, what year? What date? Do you remember? I mm, can't remember. 45 or? Probably 45, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Near the end of the war, or was the war over? Or? Well, when I was in Mountain Home, Idaho, uh, the war not Japan. Okay. The regular war was over in Europe. Europe. And uh, the way to get out of there, you had to have points, mm -hmm. point system. And the points is, is if you had overseas duty, uh, or how long, how many months, and so forth. Uh, one of the guys there lived in Seattle, Washington. And that wasn't too far from Mountain Home, Idaho. Mm -hmm. So he was one of the first guys in the barracks to go. And so, you know, we just couldn't believe that some guy was leaving us. He was going to get out of this outfit. So, about a month later, he came back in civvies, in his civil, I mean, his regular dress, not in uniform. Nobody recognized him. <laughs> That's right, yeah. He brought apples with him, though. <laughs> yeah. So where were you when the so where were you when the war ended? Or how did it end for you? Well, when I had enough points, uh, you know, everybody the war's over, and everybody says I was home when the war in England was when the Europe was war was over. I was home on a furlough, and they decided that uh, oh boy, you get to, you can stay home now. Oh no, you got to go back then get mustered out mm -hmm. and come through. And uh, I remember coming back. I went to Camp Atterbury. I was mustered out of there. Where's that at? Up in Indiana. Okay. What rank were you when you finally? Staff Sergeant. Left. Mm -hmm. Staff. But uh, when I was a civilian before the war, I was drafted. A bunch of guys around Cincinnati here where I hung out with. One guy was older than us and he was one of those goodbye dear, I'll be back in a year. He went up first. He left first. Mm -hmm. Name was Bump, Bump Geisen. I'm coming through Atterbury on the way back. And who's sitting at the card table? Bump Geisen. He's mustering, he's processing me out of the army. And I said, what happened to you? He never went overseas. He didn't have enough points to get out. Oh, so he might still be there. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. So, so then when I, 
I'll never forget this. I came by the Bury and I got on a bus. And I came past a Greyhound bus. It was going to take me to the terminal down Cincinnati. And that bus went right past my house. And I was going to tell them, let me out here, but they don't let you out. Yeah. So I had to go to the terminal and I had to take a streetcar back to my house. Mm -hmm. And what a day that was when I walked in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Safe and home. Safe and sound. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But there were good times and there were bad times. What kind? When you were uh, flying the combat missions, was it just as hard every time that you went, or did you find that you began to accept it, that it got easier in any way, or was, was it even worse because you were worried uh, if you were going to make it to 50? I would say uh, there wasn't an easy mission because there was a lot of unknowns. You never knew if it was going to be a milk run or what. Uh, the biggest fear was, well, I say fear, we were young. We didn't know if we were in trouble or not. We had faith that the pilot was going to take us there and bring us back. Uh, Scared? Yes. Scared as hell. You try to make yourself as small as you could. Uh, hope that nobody else got hurt. Unfortunately, that was right. Next question. Any other question? Seems like your hearing's fine, so it yeah. didn't affect your hearing? The mm -hmm. All the shooting and noise in the airplane? No. Well, he doesn't always hear mom when she's yelling at him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's very selective. <laughs> selective, 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 selective hearing. hearing. Okay. Selective hearing. All right, so we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at some of the stuff that you've got. Oh, there's the old air metal. Air metal. Air metal. With the oak leaf clusters. We call them oatmeal clusters. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the ribbon for ribbons for Ribbons for the dairies here. Mm -hmm. Where you were in your, in your wings. Here's a piece of flack. Okay. Well, you brought a piece back? Uh-huh. Oh. Wasn't in me. <laughs> Thank God. Didn't you know what that is, don't you? It's yeah, a ruptured, ruptured that's duct. That's the ruptured duct, yeah. <laughs> that was a pin that said you had been discharged, you'd been in service. Yeah. They called it a ruptured duct. So what are, are you? One, two, three, four. Tell us what the four are. When you get to so many air missions, you get a cluster. Air metal, and then you get another more missions. You get cluster mm -hmm. and cluster. They didn't keep giving you a metal all the time. They just gave you a cluster yeah. with it. Thing to add to it. But what are these three now? I don't know. Oh, one's this is my good. Con this is my good contact metal. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> of course, I wouldn't expect <laughs> any less. I think this is Mediterranean, and I can't remember. You know what you can do now? You can write to the government, and they'll send you if you didn't receive your medals, or they'll send you medals, and they'll yeah. describe it all to us. Well, that's very nice. And then Perfect. here is a model of the airplane. And here is my... This is the helmet you really wore. Uh, you aren't with the government, are you, Mr. Peter? Uh. This is my helmet. Let's try it on, see if it still fits. Nah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> and here's the goggles. And this is the thing that you're supposed to look right in the sun and nobody can, you can see everything. Like, that's what they said when that, they gave it to that's us. What they, that's, what they, <laughs> that's what they told you. That's what they told that's us. What yes. They said, uh-huh. The only thing it did was kept our eyes warm. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Those are great, Chris. It's still all together. Yeah, it's still holding up. Everything, everything that was made was made very well. 